Hello and welcome to FFRF's Ask an Atheist. I am Andrew Seidel, the Director of Strategic Response here at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. And I've got a great guest today who wrote a new biography about her journey away from religion. I'm really excited to talk to Alice today. Uh, if you have questions, you can put them right here in the comments on Facebook, or you can email them to askanatheist at ffrf.org. And bef before we get to the interview with Alice, again, super excited to talk about this book. But before we do that, we got to touch on one other thing. Because on this show over the past few weeks, we've had on experts on Christian nationalism to talk about the Capitol siege. Catherine Stewart, who wrote The Power Worshippers, Chrissy Stroop, um, another journalist and an evangelical. I, I know a thing or two about Christian nationalism myself. We've had on experts who have tracked and opposed and reported on judges with our own Elizabeth Cavell, who wrote a report warning of the way Christian nationalist judges have tainted the federal judiciary for a generation. And despite overwhelming evidence, clear precedent, a clear constitutional demand, and the brilliant work of Representative Jamie Raskin and the other House managers, the Senate acquitted Donald Trump of inciting an insurrection in the most bipartisan presidential impeachment conviction vote in history. And that's a problem for another day. But we do want to take a moment to recognize Representative Raskin as a true American hero. The case he put on was brilliant and brilliantly argued and done in the wake of national and personal tragedy. He quoted Voltaire several times and Thomas Paine even more. Uh, U.S. Representative Jamie Raskin is a co-founder of the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, along with Jared Huffman. He represents Maryland's 8th Congressional District, and before serving in Congress, he was a three-term state senator in Maryland and a professor of constitutional law at American University's Washington College of Law for more than 25 years. And in 2019, perhaps his most prestigious moment ever, uh, Jamie Raskin accepted FFRF's Clarence Darrow Award. And I just want to play a little bit of his acceptance speech. Hello to all my friends out at the Freedom From Religion Foundation. We got a First Amendment, which gave everybody um, a uh, right to freely exercise religion as they see fit, a right of freedom of speech, and also no establishment of religion. Um, and I think that that is what resonates, of course, with the, the name of uh, your strong and growing organization. No establishment of religion, free exercise of religion, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom to pe petition government for redress of grievances, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, all of these freedoms of the human mind to go together. Um, and that was a great uh, breakthrough victory in our constitution for progress of human society and human understanding. And it allowed us to say that government would be concerned with uh, reason and we would try to govern based on reason and based on uh, a passionate commitment to the rights of everyone. So that's Jamie Raskin accepting FFRF's Clarence Darrow Award. The full video is on our YouTube channel. Darrow, of course, was a lawyer who was famous for taking cases because they were right, including the Scopes Monkey Trial, uh, which he didn't win in court, but absolutely won in the court of history and public opinion. And we believe that history will honor Jamie Raskin similarly. So here's to you, Representative Raskin. Now, Darrow also fought creationism, and eventually courts held that it was unconstitutional to teach in public schools. Uh, homeschooling is a little bit of a different story. Uh, my next guest was raised deep in the Christian evangelical charismatic movement. She learned creationism in her homeschool. Uh, but that's just where her journey begins. Alice Gretchen is an actress. You've seen her on shows like Lincoln Heights, The Lion Game, The Young and the Restless. And in movies like Sex Drive, Shrooms, Fat Albert, and the Dukes of Hazard, Her new book, Wayward, a, a memoir of spiritual war warfare and sexual purity, tells the story of her transition from Christianity to atheism, a journey that inspired her to found DareToDoubt.org, a research a resource, excuse me, that helps others detach from harmful belief systems. So, Alice Gretchen, welcome to Ask an Atheist. Thank you so much for having me. 
You know, I realized when I was writing this intro, we were just talking about it before the show, that it's, it's been basically exactly a year since we last saw each other. I was in L.A. on the Founding Myth Tour on February 27th, and we've basically been in lockdown since then. So so first off, how are you coping with the, the pandemic? Are you safe? Are you, are you making it? Yes, I'm safe. I'm making it. I've somehow managed to stay COVID free in Los Angeles, which, you know, as everyone knows, has kind of become an epicenter similar to New York. But yeah, I'm good. I've I got this book published. So I feel like I can come out of quarantine feeling pretty accomplished and grateful. Well, well done. And so you said you sent me wayward in January, um, actually, just like a couple of weeks after the assault on January 6th. This, the assault was definitely on our collective mind. And then I opened up the book and chapter one is called The Lord's Army. And it's kind of this, this harrowing introduction of your religion and, and really the indoctrination of children. And it was especially alarming for me, given the rise of Christian nationalism that we've seen over the past few years. So, so tell me about being in the Lord's army. Yes. So the release of my book coincided with, uh, I wouldn't want to say like a good time because what we saw on January 6th was not good, but it was also very unsurprising to me, to you, Mm -hmm. to many others who understand the very real threat of Christian nationalism. Uh, so the Lord's army, that chapter I was about, five, about kindergarten age. And uh, it's the church that I grew up in, in Illinois, um, was very, my children's ministry teacher, uh, very creatively was the one who first taught me what it meant to battle in spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare, for those who don't know, is basically um, the ultimate battle between good and evil and God versus Satan. And she introduced us to this battle by talking about the armor of God and how important it was to suit up in the armor of God. Um, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, et cetera. Um, so as a little kid, uh, I, I just learned like, wow, there's this heinous Satan devil creature and he has lesions of demons in his army and they're always trying to get me. And ultimately the goal is they want to get me and bring me to hell to torture forever. And in my mind, that looked like, um, one of the last little segments of the Disney film Fantasia, where there's like this oh, yeah, Dante's yeah. Inferno-esque mm-hmm. hell, hell vision. And so I was properly terrified. Um, and well, that's, and, and that's it's not a metaphor for you, right? Like when you're, when you're that age, yeah. this is not, me- I mean, I, the, I think the armor of God, you'll correct me if I'm wrong. I think that's from Ephesians six. Yes. I mean, that, that it's in the Bible, but I mean, the, the war that you're, this is not a metaphorical war. This is real war. And, it, and it's portrayed like that to children. Yes. Uh, And I I especially took things very literally. Not everyone in my church or even within my family took things quite as literally as I did. But I just figured, like, why would people be saying this if it wasn't true or if it was symbolic? Surely they would explain to me, like, this isn't real. It's just, you know, how we're illustrating this point or something Mm -hmm. like that. So it was very real to me Um, all throughout my my late teens, early twenties, I just imagined that this, that there was just like an invisible spirit realm among us where like, say I was tempted to, to like read a naughty book. I just imagined like, oh, there were demons whispering in my ear, like do it, do it, sin, lust, go against God's will for your life and join the army of evil. So I just always imagined every micro decision I made in my life, um, from what I ate to what I wore, what I listened to, what I watched, it was always through that lens of spiritual warfare. And so all that's being part of the Lord's army, which I mean, which really bleeds very clearly into Christian nationalism. And you talk later in the book uh, 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 more explicitly about that, like going to Lou Engel, uh, who's sort of a, a virulent Christian nationalist. You went to his uh prayer rally, one of his prayer rallies, the call, I believe it was. Um, I mean, and this is well, do you, do you want to talk a little bit about how that developed as you got older then? Yes. So uh, it when I my family moved around a lot when I was a kid, but we ended up in Kansas City, Missouri for a while. And when I was 14, around 14, my youth group from Kansas City um, hosted Lou Engel at our church. Uh, and it was Metro Christian Fellowship, which is a big evangelical church connected to the International House of Prayer. Um, mm-hmm. And Lou Engel basically shared a prophecy with us that he that he had that a million youth would gather on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. on Labor Day, the year 2000, to fast and pray for our nation to be brought back to God. And so I went with my youth group to Washington, D.C., 
And uh, we fasted and prayed and cried and wept and pr- sang in tongues. And there were, it was, I describe it in my book as it was like a part prayer festival, part political rally. It, it felt momentous to us at the time. And we prayed for things like the overturning of Roe v. Wade, mm-hmm. for the banning of, of gay marriage, for um, things that, uh, that are very humanist values, frankly. And we did this in the name of love. For me, um, I thought that God, I believed that God was love and this was how God's children were supposed to love each other was by avoiding these demonic things that uh, were were against the Bible. And so um, I, that's where I would say my my indoctrination to spiritual warfare really came, really started to come out in a very political, uh, real world expression. And then that influenced how I voted the first time I could vote after I turned 18, um, voting for candidates that uh, represented those conservative Christian values, because ultimately it's just important to stay on God's side in the spiritual war. So. <laughs> Hence, it is not surprising at all to see where we're at today. Um, a lot of those insurrectionists are around my age and very likely received a very similar indoctrination in their church youth groups and in their Christian education books. Absolutely. I mean, it's that overlap of religion and politics that that is so deeply concerning. And you, you mentioned that your family moved around a lot. But first of all, tell us a little bit about your family, you know, just your mom, dad and your siblings. But you also you moved around, not just a lot, but because of God, you moved around. Like you, you were, you were commanded to, if I remember that correctly. Yes. I believe my parents would probably say the word led or inspired, led, but yes, okay, it yes. Was, I was commanded. So yes, I'm, I'm the oldest of five kids and I was homeschooled my pretty much throughout my entire life until I went to community college for a brief bit. Um, and my parents, when I was around eight years old, they became heavily involved in a, a charismatic revival movement that nowadays would, uh, I see most commonly referred to as the Toronto blessing. And basically it was, it became an international revival movement that, um, is characteristically, uh, holy roller style. A lot of people like falling on the floor, having visions, miracle healings, um, casting out demons, that sort of thing, a very, very demonstrative expression of the Christian faith. Um, and that, in short, uh, transformed my parents' faith in many ways and really radicalized, uh, how they wanted to live out their faith. And they believed that God, um, long story short, they they believed that God was calling them and us to surrender our worldly possessions and employment and to trust in him to provide. And so God uh, led us to sell our house and uh, most of our things, some of our sentimental things were put into storage and we traveled, we camped. Now, when I say that my family and I were homeless, we were technically without a home, without employment. Mm-hmm. Um, and we lived, but we weren't like camping out on the sidewalk. We camped out in literal campgrounds most of the time. My mom had a book of free campgrounds in the United States. And sometimes we would meet people at these campgrounds who would be uh, inspired by our journey and they would invite us to come stay with them and, and their families for a little bit. So we traveled all around North America. Uh, and this was during my middle school years. My dad's period of unemployment started when I was 11 and he didn't regain worldly employment again until I was 14 and we sort of settled in Kansas City before eventually moving to Colorado until I moved to Los Angeles on my own. <laughs> you know, I felt that was one of the parts where I was really I really felt for for you, for the young Alice who's just leading this this unsettled life. And like, we always hear about how kids need structure and they need routine and all this and how how hard that must have been for you. And it kind of does come through and you can sort of sense your frustration a little bit. Um, now, you mentioned community college and being in Colorado before you went to LA, you were going to be a missionary nurse. You, 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 you were going to go to school to become a missionary nurse, travel the world, spread the good word, heal people, and then turned model, turned actress, living on your own in LA at 17 years old, but still as like a very devout Christian. So I, I, I think a lot of our, our listeners are gonna be confused by that. Can you kind of explain that transition a little bit for us? Yes, uh, it's, it's a totally fair question. Um, a lot of people are very shocked that my parents would have allowed me to move to L.A., the, the American epicenter of hedonism. With it the seems like strict... a little bit of a contradiction. It does seem yes. like... <laughs> <laughs> that's, 
that's totally fair. That's totally fair. So um, honestly, it, it happened because we at the time viewed it the opportunity to pursue acting in LA as a door God was opening. Um, becoming an actress and model was not something that I always wanted to do. Like you said, I was I was set on the trajectory of going to nursing school and eventually I wanted to join Youth with a Mission, which is a big missionary organization worldwide. And uh, I thought that I would administer God's love through the practical care of healthcare. And I really wanted to. Um, I thought that my the, the purpose of my life was to give glory to God through acts of service and and honor to him. So I figured that's the most what, what could be more serviceable or honorable than um, helping to care for people while at the same time sharing God's salvation with them. So that was my plan because I was homeschooled my whole life. I graduated early and I was able to start community college relatively young, uh, shortly before I turned 16. So uh, simultaneously, I was approached by modeling scouts uh, and Ultimately, yeah, one of them just said, like, we, we really think that you have a shot at having a career in this profession, and would you and your parents please consider it? So we did. We prayed over it, and simultaneously, the doors to nursing uh, were closing for a variety of reasons. So I figured God must be opening this door, and maybe this is how he's going to provide the money for me to finish nursing school and do my discipleship training school with YWAM. And so uh, that's how I ended up meeting a talent manager from L.A. who then invited me to um, broaden my modeling prospects by foraying into acting. And again, it was through the lens of God opening a door that my parents uh, and myself were even willing to consider it. Um, and I was very fortunate and started booking within my first year of being in L.A. And so it just seemed at the time like further confirmation from God that this is my mission field. Hollywood is my mission field. These sinful liberals are my mission field. So that's where uh, <laughs> that's and I've been here 18 years now. I just had my 18 year L.A. anniversary. So congratulations. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, you're walking you're walking into the lion's den. Um, and, you know, I mean, I was really struck, too. And I, I, I mean, the, the subtitle is Spiritual Warfare and Sexual, a memoir of spiritual warfare and sexual purity. And I, you, you talk in the book about this purity culture. And I want to I want to talk about like a couple different things here. The, the first thing that really struck me was you're in L.A. Now you're, you're breaking into acting you're, and you're taking this acting class and it's colliding just in this really kind of brutal way with <laughs> acting in purity culture and you're you have this kiss that you have to do laura laura and mitch the characters in the glass menagerie from tennessee williams play have to kiss and you're in acting class and you, you have to do this and and you describe just this immense guilt that that comes with purity culture but also what you were just describing that god really wants you to act and that this is important and you 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 do a great job of sort of recounting the the internal struggle, but also the rationalizations that are going on. It, it was it was a fascinating part of the story for of your story for me. Oh, thank you. I, I appreciate you using the word brutal. <laughs> it it, it seemed that internally way. Internally brutal. Yes, yes. And like like on the outside, it, it's it's like whatever. I had to do an acting kiss. I was I was uh it was right after I turned seventeen, I believe. Most people, um, maybe not most, but a, a good amount of people would have had their first kiss by then. I never even held a guy's hand. I'd never had a boyfriend. I was very um, devoted to waiting for my future husband and uh, the purity culture that I uh, was a part of and wanted to be a part of was largely based on um, the books by Eric and Leslie Ludi called When God Writes Your Love Story or the even more famous uh, I Kiss Dating Goodbye by Joshua Harris, which these books teach that um, God has your future spouse already picked out and you must honor them and be faithful to them even before you know them. And what this means is like not even indulging in fantasies about a crush because it's emotionally cheating on your future spouse and the plan God has for your life. And I completely bought into the promise that if I was faithful in my heart, body, soul, if I was faithful to my future husband, the way that I believed God wanted me to be, God was going to reward me with this epic romance um, that would be far beyond anything that my my little romantic heart could imagine. And uh, I, so I was very, very earnest in my devotion to this future spouse. And in the acting, acting, I'm 
I'm a young girl. I'm going to go out for young girl roles. And usually young people have a, a love story. And I knew I would probably have to kiss someone at some point, but it happened really fast in that class. And I'm kind of, I was kind of grateful it did instead of on an actual film or TV set. Um, but it was just excruciating for me because I felt so unfaithful to my future spouse and ambivalently faithful and unfaithful to what I believed God called me to do, because it's like, God, you, you wanted me to stay pure and faithful to this future husband, but yet you've called me to acting. And, um, I rationalized it, like you said, by saying, this isn't, this isn't Alice kissing my scene partner. This is my character, Laura kissing Jim. And my, my real first kiss is still waiting for my wedding day because I was mm -hmm. absolutely sure that I was never going to kiss a man as myself until my literal wedding day at the altar. Um, and yeah, it was, it was a Hollywood challenge, all of my Christian values at once, the language that I had to use. Um, I had to really practice swearing because it just didn't float <laughs> off my tongue as naturally as a uh, faking praying in tongues did, for instance. <laughs> I do not have that problem. I mean, it, it was also, you, you mentioned that it was, you kind of got a little bit lucky because the character in that, that scene, Laura is sort of shy and reserved and a little bit, I think, taken aback by the kiss. So your, your natural or your, your, uh, indoctrinated, I guess I should say, guilt sort of actually helped you, the scene look more realistic. Uh, I was also struck, though, I mean, this this to me, it, your story kind of brought it home in a way that reading just kind of general stories about purity culture can't, but that, that having that individual who's gone through it talk about it, it really struck me how much purity culture is geared towards destroying your or and uh, other women's autonomy. And, and you tell this story that just blew me away about this guy coming sort of out, of out of your past, kind of out of nowhere and saying, I'm going to marry you. Th that whole thing about God choosing somebody like I'm the guy who's God chose God has chosen it. And, and your parents and his parents, they all agree that this is like God's will and you just have to submit to it. It was it was it was so strange to read. And I can't imagine what it was like to go through. But you do a good job of, of telling it. Thank you. Yes, that was it was strange to me at the time too, not necessarily how it unfolded, uh, because the promise of, again, the type of purity culture that I grew up in was, um, when you don't date, how are you supposed to know when they're the one? Well, mm -hmm. you'll know because God's going to confirm it through your spiritual elders, often your Christian parents or your pastors or other spiritual mentors in your life. That way you can discern whether this is something your flesh wants is to date this person or court this person. It's called courtship, uh, not worldly dating. Um, and, and, uh, what happened was, uh, yeah, he was a dear friend of mine, um, from my youth group who had also moved to Los Angeles around the same time I did. And we'd never dated. Um, but one day to me, it felt completely out of the blue. He just sort of announced that God had showed him I was his future wife. And I never even questioned the veracity of his claim because it just made sense to me because God never talked to me. He never spoke to me. And even though I very much believed in him and devoted my life to him, I gave up long ago on the, on thinking that God would ever speak to me directly. I was like, all right, this is just how God communicates is through the other people, particularly the men in my life. Um, and then God's will that I marry this guy was confirmed through my father, who said that God had showed him as well, and then the guy's mother. And altogether, that just looks like a lot of um, a lot of evidence of confirmation that, yeah, this is God's will, and it didn't matter that I didn't love him. I, I wasn't attracted to him that way, and I cared for him as a friend, but I felt so deeply betrayed because I'd done everything right. I'd followed all the rules. I was so faithful and pure, and I just felt... I was 17 at the time, too. This was my first year in L.A., and I just felt floored that this this wasn't how it was supposed to be. And it was the first time my faith was truly shaken. Um, and the betrothal lasted for a couple months. And I, I say in the book, and I mean it to this day, breaking it off was the scariest thing that I'd ever done. And my mom was the one who gave me the courage to do that because she was the only one who hadn't heard from God that I was supposed to marry him. And she could tell that I was very unhappy. And uh, so thanks, mom. <laughs> Yeah, she was the only one who had the courage to say she hadn't heard from God. Uh, nobody else was here. From God. <laughs> um, I mean, you, you said like that was that was the scariest. And you kind of talk a little bit in the book about how that might have been your first break from evangelical Christianity. Is that do you think that's fair? 
Yes, that's fair. Uh, I I wouldn't have known it at the time, and and you know, there's nothing like retrospect mm -hmm. to sort of help you put perspective on these things and be able to track a, a sure. chronological timeline. But uh, I did know, like, it took the the year following the breaking off of my betrothal. I was just waiting for God's consequences to hit me because I I'd, I'd willfully disobeyed Him. Um, mm -hmm. I thought my mom was just being used by Satan to give my flesh what it wanted, which was to not marry someone I didn't love. And uh, I felt for sure that I was going to suffer the spiritual warfare consequences of not being on God's team yeah. and therefore giving Satan a foothold to drag me to hell as him and his demons were going to get me. And uh, I'd given them full permission to do so by walking away from the plan that God clearly laid out. And so that in following from 17 to age 2021, 20, I really was experimenting with what I now know to be progressive Christianity. Um, mm -hmm. I wouldn't have called it at the time. I eventually even stopped calling myself a Christian and called myself a follower of Christ because I felt um, that the <laughs> distinction allowed sure. some space between the rigid legalistic Christianity I knew, which everyone, myself included, would have totally denied was legalistic. We, I didn't even consider myself religious. In, in my upbringing, religious was a bad word. It was like a slur to be religious. You're, you're spirit-led or spirit-filled. You're not religious because um, Jesus hated the religious people, the Pharisees. He liked the, It was to be led by the Holy Spirit and the spontaneity. So I grew up ultra religious, believing that I was not religious at all. And uh, <laughs> my, my foray into progressive Christianity um, I really wanted to practice the type of Christianity that was more love focused, that was LGBTQ affirming, um, that was a little bit more pro-choice and- uh, Sure, it's sure more popular in LA too. Yes, yes, <laughs> it, it is. And I, I, I tried going to a few Christian churches out here, but they weren't, they weren't for me. I was very easily uh, triggered, you might say, um, and going through what I now know are symptoms of religious trauma, which are very common with people who grew up in um, ultra strict or fundamentalist upbringings like myself. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it was you, what you just said too was fascinating. You know, you you talked about this guilt and how evil you felt, and you were waiting for God's consequences for not marrying somebody you didn't love. And it's just so str I mean, that's such a backward system and such an anti-human system that would impose that on you. Uh, I, it, leaving Christianity is slow, and you you mentioned this, you know, and it, it's kind of hard to pinpoint what starts it. I, I always think of it as kind of a series of dominoes sort of mm -hmm. falling in slow motion. And it's really hard to pinpoint one or the other, but one thought or doubt or thread kind of leads to another and then to another, and then eventually to, to intellectual freedom and honesty, uh, wayward as the Bible might put it. I mean, do you remember any of the dominoes specifically or, or not really just like it was just too much of a, a gradual transition? Yes. So I would say um, the the betrothal was probably the first major domino. And mm -hmm. then following that in the year following, while I was waiting for the consequences of my disobedience, they didn't come. And so that was another domino of realizing I disobeyed God and nothing bad happened. Uh, another domino was the first time I had sex. Uh, I fully expected to feel enormously guilty or ashamed uh, for giving away something I could never get back. And I, w I believed what the books and and youth group leaders told me that I would feel like I left a piece of myself with, with a man that I slept with. And uh, I didn't feel that at all. I felt totally mm -hmm. fine. I felt uh, relieved, you know, to like not be the only virgin I knew anymore. Um, I felt that was another domino was just realizing bad things didn't happen. Followed by, I would say the other little littler dominoes was the were the love that my secular friends showed me. Um, it defied everything that I was taught about the secular world. <laughs> I was taught that people who do, who aren't Christian are broken and uh, they need saving, and it was like. I actually feel way more accepted and genuinely loved here than I did in prayer circles with Christian friends who we would lovingly call each other out on our sins under the guise of prayer <laughs> accountability groups. And it felt, it felt to me uh, like a, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> um, it, yeah, all of these little dominoes added up. Um, mm -hmm. I just found so much more love and, and happiness and acceptance and forgiveness in the secular world than I was ever supposed to. 
One well, one thing that I really found, and it was it was interesting from a from an, a, a writer from an author standpoint. You know, you arrived in LA, this devout believer, and then you, I think maybe because you were alone, maybe because you were out there on your own, you started journaling, and, and you talk about how in the book sometimes you did it for hours, uh, and it's it's awesome because you were able to look back at those journals when you were writing the autobiography and pull from them. And you were really able to capture your mindset in a way that I think a lot of people who are writing an autobiography might wish they had the opportunity to do. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I've, I'm very, I lucked out with that, uh, that I, that I've been such an avid journal keeper. Um, I definitely reference that a lot. I have over, I have almost 30 hard copy journals that I've kept wow. since I was like eight or nine years old. And then certainly through my teen years, I, I journaled almost every day. I had a prayer journal. I had a regular journal. I had a poetry journal. Um, I've just always been a writer. And it was like the one outlet that I had where no one could correct me. No one could interrupt me. <laughs> and uh, like it true was, freedom. Yeah. True freedom, true freedom. And, um, mm-hmm. and yeah, I definitely reference those as well as letters when I was writing wayward to just sort of remember, um, my state of mind, who said what, what date it was and where I was living. Uh, it, it was very helpful to have those records to reference. And it really adds nice color and, and authority to the book in, in an interesting way. Um, I also, I have to say too, I'm a, I'm a bibliophile. I collect books. It's, it's a, it's a problem. It's a real problem. I have first editions, first printings, like dusty leather bound volumes. And, and this is a beautiful book. Like I love the, I mean the cover, I mean, you got the serpent and the fruit, like you obviously know where you're alluding to here, Uh, but guilt, but guilt is also a common theme in the book and in the Bible and in Christianity and in the story here. Um, and, and you wrote, um, the beginning of part four, I forgave myself for being female. And that just kind of like broke my heart. It, I mean, it, it brought home the beauty of the cover and all that, but it really, that, that phrase really kind of broke my heart. Uh, t- t- tell us about that. Ooh, well, first of all, shout out to my cover designer, Cameron Stein at Greenleaf Book Group, who, who he, I had my own cover ideas and I wasn't attached to them. And I told him like, please show me what, what you think after you read the manuscript. And that's what he came up with. And I'm, I was floored. I was like, this, this is it. This is it. So thanks, <laughs> yeah. Cameron. Um, it is beautiful. It's like, I kind of want to, I, wow. It's, it's just a beautiful work of art. So the verse, the, the section that you're referring to where I forgive myself for being female, uh, that came that came out of um, my first year uh, that I after I'd broken off my betrothal I was 18 years old I was modeling and I got an offer to do a topless modeling gig and uh, I it was a total act of rebellion for me against the God who had betrayed me um, and all of the purity culture teachings that I now questioned because they didn't turn out the way I'd been promised uh, I I, when I did that photo shoot, I had what someone might call like a, almost like a mystical experience of just feeling utterly transformed, um, going into it, expecting like, oh no, is this a bad idea? Am I going to feel embarrassed or ashamed? Fuck that. I'm just going to do it anyway. So I, I did it. And I, what I was not prepared for was how empowered I felt. I could have been, I could have cried. I felt so electrified and it sounds so, um, so cheesy. It's like, it sounds skeezy even to say out loud, but it, it really was a powerful moment of transformation for me where I went from being this covered up ultra modest girl to like shedding layers, like a snake to go back to the cover art. Yeah. Um, and, and discovered, uh, what it felt like to feel powerful. And I felt like this is what every religion is threatened by is this feeling I'm having right now as a sensually embodied woman like this is why they want to keep us covered up because there is nothing more powerful that i've felt than feeling all of the in, in essence the power of creation because what is sex appeal it's the creation appeal i think one could argue so it's uh it from that moment forward i i was like no i'm gonna embrace my personal expression of womanhood and what that means to me. And it's different for everyone. For many women, it feels way more empowering to cover up. And I think that that is just as like exquisite uh, a realization for an individual to have. And so for me, my expression of femalehood was in a, you might say a more um, traditionally classic femme, whatever words we want to use, uh, expression. And it felt true to me and it allowed me to like that, 
I, I found so much sanctity in rebellion and that helped heal me, honestly, um, allowing me to let go like physically, um, of all of the, the hard wiring of shame and, yeah. um, just all of that. So it, it, re it, it really is like a garden of Eden moment. I, and that's <laughs> one of the, that's one of the reasons I put it kind of brought everything together. I mean, you're, you're, you, I agree. I, shedding the skin, shedding that purity, shedding that guilt. Um, it was, it, it was just this, this amazing sort of like almost a culmination of this amazing journey. And it, and it's what, this is a journey that takes a lot of intellectual honesty and courage to make. I mean, a lot of people struggle with this <clears throat> and then, once they get to the other side, they they have this freedom, and it's wonderful. But it can come with a cost, and and you talk about that in the book too. You talk about how uh, you started having panic attacks, and you already mentioned uh, religious trauma earlier on, um, and those led you to create Dare to Doubt. So I, I'd really like you got to tell everybody what this is. Tell us about the the trauma and about how Dare to Doubt helped you deal with it and and helps others. Thank you. So, um, so when I completely lost my faith, I was 21 and that's when I became an atheist. I gave God a test and he failed it. Uh, and <laughs> I, I felt like pretty numb for a week. Uh, I just, the world looked completely different in a way that I wouldn't have been able to articulate then. But now in retrospect, I was just without that lens of spiritual warfare and, and Christianity, I had no idea what existence was, what I was doing here, why we ate food. I, d I didn't know anything. I felt infantile. Like I just, everything looked different to me. And, uh, and then I found like the feelings of freedom, the, the high, yeah. like, oh my gosh, if God's not real, Satan's not real. And that means I can read whatever I want. I can wear whatever I want. I can listen to whatever music I want. I can go out for that R-rated movie. So it was, uh, it, it was incredibly liberating. And then that lasted for maybe a month or two. And then came the crash that started with the panic attacks. And I, at the time, did not know what a panic attack was. Um, I started mm -hmm. having them almost exactly two months after God failed his test and I lost my faith. Um, I didn't even put that together at the time at all. I thought I was just going crazy for no good reason. And um, my mom came out to help me find a therapist. Neither of us knew what, what was happening, but basically I just, I felt, um, Anyone who has had a panic attack or anxiety attack knows, but for those who, who are fortunate to not know what it feels like, it basically feels like you're dying and you can't breathe and you don't know why. There's no rational reason why you're feeling this way. Um, and uh, I, I started going to therapy, eventually found a therapist that was able to help me. Religious trauma was not really much of a conversation in the late 2000s. This would have been, gosh, around like, 2007, 2008. Um, mm -hmm. I don't, there was not the literature on it that there is now. It, there were starts of it, but um, today I'm so grateful that there are a plethora of therapists and counselors who are at least aware of religious trauma, if not specializing in them. And uh, ultimately, I was in therapy for three years with a secular therapist. I've since found out that he actually is a very secular therapist. Um, but at the time, all I knew was that he felt safe. He didn't have crystals in his office. He didn't try to tell me to meditate. Um, he felt mm -hmm. not spiritual and therefore safe to me. And uh, it really helped. And then it wasn't until I was uh, like 27, I was in my late 20s that I came across an article by Dr. Marlene Winnell, who coined the term religious mm -hmm. trauma syndrome. And she uh, wrote a book called Leaving the Fold, a guide for former fundamentalists and others leaving their religion. And I read it in one sitting and I was just bawling the whole time because she legitimized not only the panic attacks that I had, that I came to understand were from so many like nearly like two decades of, of programming to believe that I'm going to go to hell. Satan's going to get me. I'm just waiting for a cancer diagnosis. I'm just waiting for a car accident. I'm just waiting for an earthquake to swallow me up. Chronic fear. I lived in so much chronic fear consciously and unconsciously after I left my faith. Um, and I was very easily triggered by even the, 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 what you could argue are the, the good qualities of religion, like beautiful religious artwork. I think religions inspired a lot of, a lot of the world's most beautiful artwork. And I remember being at a museum 
uh, surrounded by this beautiful religious artwork. And all it took was a docent shushing someone. And instantly I had a flashback of being in like really? church with all of this religious iconography and being shushed because the pastor's talking and I started hyperventilating wow. and I ran outside and I was just trying to breathe. And so I was really sensitive to, to the slightest hint of faith, as I've said, as I've put it before. And, um, learning about religious trauma syndrome really helped me because it allowed me to contextualize and put a label on and therefore understand what mm -hmm. had been happening to me throughout my 20s, why friends of mine would be talking about their meditation practice and I'd be like trying not to scream and like choke them <laughs> um, through, <laughs> yeah. through just my own like visceral yeah. reaction to like, why is that meditation practice real for you the way why was the Holy Spirit real for these people? Why was God leaving me out? Like what's so awful about me and so broken and wrong with me that whatever that other divine, whatever you want to call it is, never touched me despite my most earnest attempts. And so uh, it, religious trauma syndrome and just religious trauma in general, learning about all that, what I was going through was totally normal. And fast yeah. forward to uh, two years ago, um, having done a lot of work on myself and I'm still, you know, working, working through and processing things. I really wanted to make an organization that made it easier for people like my 21 year old self to find help if they were also going through, um, the grief and utterly destabilizing experience of a loss of faith. And so I, I founded dare to doubt.org and I wanted to make it a, a resource site, um, where people from different faith backgrounds, uh, you're able to search by, by your, belief system, whether it's Mormonism or um, I just put the Jehovah's Witness page up recently, <laughs> um, you're able to find resources by your background or by what your immediate needs are. Like I have the crisis care page, which if you're if you're kicked out of your home because you've come out to your parents as gay, um, where you can find a domestic shelter, where you can find secular therapy, where you can find uh, online support, like a peer support group where you guys can talk. So. I wanted to make it easier than mm -hmm. than the experience that I had trying to find help for what I needed. And there, it's it's so great out there now, guys. There's so many resources available, and my site is not an exhaustive list. Um, I need to update it a lot. It's just me running it. So, uh, but it is to... it is a really great start. I mean, and the resources on there. I was just looking at it uh, yesterday. They really are helpful. So, I mean, if you're if you're questioning or doubting or scared to doubt or struggling. And you're hearing this. I mean, please go check out DareToDoubt.org, and I mean, it, it is worth doing. It's. It, I hope you keep it up. Um, and I do have to say, we're, we have a bunch of questions coming in, uh, mostly on email. It looks like, um, but it's not often that we have like glamorous movie stars on the show. We are <laughs> more of a magnet for for nerds. I say that as a proud nerd. So tell me about Girls Guts Glory. So I'm totally a nerd too. <laughs> so Girls God's Glory is my all girls dungeons and dragons group. Shout out guys. Um, normally, normally we would be, uh, we have a Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash girls God's Glory. And normally on Wednesday mornings, we would be streaming game. This season we pre-recorded our games over Zoom because obviously we're not able to get together in the pandemic. But yeah, so I've been playing D&D &D with these gals for a few years now. And um, it's been, it's been, so much fun. Uh, and I have to say, and I've talked about this with some other D&D &D players too, who also grew up religiously. Many of us were not allowed to go anywhere near Dungeons and Dragons when we were yeah. kids. This was a Yeah, that's a real common portal. theme. <laughs> yes, yes. Like, talk about opening a door to the demonic. It's like wizardry and sorcery. Um, one of my characters is a sorceress, and I think she's the most fun one that I have playing that in a druid. Um, but anyway, yeah. We I actually, wait, we already druid. got a couple of questions about your characters, so elaborate on oh, the characters sweet. a little bit for us. <laughs> So my the character that I'm playing this season uh, that's airing right now is a centaur bard. Um, I like characters with spells. I'm big into spell casting. Uh, maybe one day I'll play like a more brute force barbarian type. But um, my OG character, which you could see here in the, on screen, was a druid. She was a little forest gnome druid named Rowan of Glen Hollyhock. Um, <laughs> and I think Call Lightning is my favorite spell when I'm playing Rowan. It's it's a great spell, guys. 
Uh, you get to zap people with lightning. Um, another character that I played, the sorcerer, uh, she's an, an Azamar sorcerer. And Azamar is like an, like an angel deity type of race. And then, mm -hmm. yeah, as a sorcerer, I get to just blast people with fire all the time. It's great. Um, and uh, it's it's very therapeutic in some ways. To But I will say, speaking of the religious trauma stuff, sometimes I do get a little triggered. Like they're, they're gods and deities are very big in the game. They're interwoven. And one time a DM I was playing with um, appeared to have one of the gods betray one of my fellow teammates who was a very loyal follower. And I was so triggered. I had to like excuse oh, myself wow. and go to the bathroom. And I was like trying to breathe. And I think I even said on our stream, I was like, fuck gods. I was just so angry. Um, wow. And I was like, no, 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 let's calm down. Like, it's just a game. It's just a game. It's intrinsic to the story. Like, calm down. But it's there's there's opportunities for being triggered in D&D as much as there are. And I would say there are more for healing um, and, and uh, mm -hmm. self-understanding and just fun. It's honestly like one of the most fun things that I have in my life going on. <laughs> And people can watch that. You said it's a Twitch channel. Is that right? Yeah. If you go to twitch.tv slash girls guts glory, um, you can find nice. us on Wednesday mornings at 10 AM. I I'm not sure how many more episodes are left of this season that are going to be airing. We're trying to figure out if we're going to do another one or not. Um, so stay tuned and you can find all of our other previous episodes on, uh, our website, girls guts glory, rpg.com. Awesome. Okay. So we have a few other questions that have come in, in our last few minutes here. Uh, one person's asking, how do you identify now? And they're also, I think that means atheist agnostic. Um, and then also they're asking about, um, where your, your siblings that you mentioned and your parents are on, on the belief spectrum. Yes. So where I am now, I'm quite happy to call myself an atheist. Uh, I look at words very uh, literally still and <laughs> very <laughs> etymologically and it just means without theism uh, i don't mm -hmm. believe in gods or deities or spirits or souls um could they be sure i think by i think again literally everyone is an agnostic which just means without knowing i think there's agnostic christians agnostic hindus i'm an agnostic atheist but i found that colloquially less literally the word agnostic um, tends to draw a more spiritually intrigued crowd than I personally mm -hmm. can relate to. Like most agnostics in my life still believe in an afterlife or a, a collective consciousness or divine source. Um, they just don't know what it is and that's fine, but I I don't believe that. So uh, I'm, I'm content to just be an atheist. That's the most succinct descriptor for me. Um, and I'm, I'm what you could say spiritually intrigued. I love, I'm fascinated by things like uh, past life therapy. Like, what is that? What is, are we, is this <laughs> dimensions we're tapping into? Like, I'm very spiritually intrigued the way um, Susan Blackmore might be uh, or some other uh, very atheistic, uh, but metaphysically curious people are. I, th I think that there's, we just haven't developed the tools to measure the abilities of consciousness yet, but it's endlessly fascinating to me. So that's how I identify. Um, and then as for my family, they're, uh, all of my siblings, uh, my four younger siblings are either atheistic or agnostic as well. None of us mm -hmm. turned out the way we were, uh, <laughs> headed toward. Um, my parents themselves are also very different now than they were when I was growing up. Um, they would not necessarily identify as Christians now. Um, I would say that they're, they're still very spiritual. Uh, but my dad, for instance, he used to be a pastor, um, mm -hmm. and he no longer believes that Jesus is the only way to heaven. He's not even sure there is a heaven, but he'd like there to be, and he believes in one. Um, mm -hmm. but he's not, he, he's not, a. Uh, He's not convinced. Uh, he doesn't live in the same sort of um, non-rule, but rule-based sort of way of living. And then my mom is also uh, a very spiritual woman and intuitive and um, always learning. Like my mom is such a bookworm and that's definitely where I get it. And uh, any writing skills I have, I have my mom thanked for them too, because she was my, my first teacher. She taught me pretty much everything. So uh, that's where they're at now. We're all still very close. That's a common question I get. So for anyone who's wondering, yes, I am still very, very close to my family. That's not to say that the publishing of this book has hasn't brought its challenges and difficulties, but sure. um, I am very deeply loved by by my family, and I am so deeply fortunate to have essentially their blessing. Uh, not that I love using that religious term, but I essentially have their support <laughs> and can, their blessing to yeah. to do this. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it's it's really interesting because you know, Dan Parker, who is the Freedom from Religion Foundation's co-president, there's there's some parallels between your story and his. Um, you know, he he actually w- was you know an itinerant preacher traveling around Mexico. That kind of that homeless period that you were talking about, very similar. And then and then he uh, he likes to say he lost faith in faith. You know, he left his religion, and then kind of dominoes in his family started to fall in a in a similar way there's a lot of parallel uh, we did get a question about whether or not you had read dan's book godless at all not yet not yet but i'd love yeah, to yeah yeah i'd be curious i'd be curious after you read it to know uh how similar you think your journeys might be having read both of them i could i could do a few more but i'll we get we have there's other questions okay um so and i think i'm going to answer this one slightly uh, Answer and alter slightly, and then I'll let you talk. I mean, one of the common counter arguments that now atheist former Christians hear, I don't get this because I'm just an atheist. I never had to do this deep deconversion, um, is the you weren't a real Christian, right? Like you didn't really believe. And I think reading this book, it's, it was clear to me that you were definitely steeped in this faith of culture. Have you heard that argument and had to rebut it? Yes, I have. Less so than I think other people have, um, because it's pretty clear, anyone who does a little bit of searching on me, like it's clear that was all I knew. Uh, I didn't even go to school. I didn't know any alternative existed. I rarely met anyone who wasn't a Christian. And if I did, it was through the lens of they're not saved and God might use me to save them. So constantly living in an evangelistic mindset when I did interact with people who were not uh, fellow believers. Um, I, I think that people who would assume that uh, my faith must not have been genuine, I can't help but assume back that perhaps theirs is less stable than they think, uh, their faith, because it, it was, it sounds to me it's a little like bit of projection. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. And and I I feel empathetic toward it because um, it's very, it's terrifying to doubt your faith. It can be. It was for me. It was absolutely terrifying. Um, And I would have looked for any reason, if I heard a deconversion story when I was still a Christian, I would have looked for any other reason um, that someone lost their faith other than that God just wasn't real to them. Um, Because that might mean God's not real to me either. And maybe I'm just pretending and and needing this validation that I'm getting from my community and this support that's very difficult to walk Mm -hmm. away from when that's your entire community and when your family is deeply entrenched um, and maybe your career is embedded in it. Um, I have so much admiration for pastors, worship leaders, other people who, whose professions were within the, the religious community. It must, it's extra more difficult for them, I think, to walk away from. Um, so my Absolutely. heart goes out to people who think that maybe I wasn't a genuine Christian because it shows me um, you're, you're, I, I feel compassionate toward that. Um, of course, there's a little bit of irritation there too. It's like, Come on, you don't know me. You don't. You can't yeah. say. <laughs> yeah, but at I mean, well, it's, also, it's intrinsic in the faith too, right? Like, there's the line, um, you know, if you if you you have the faith, what's what's it? You can move a. Is it you can move mountains or mustard seed? But the, the, yeah, if you have you enough faith, mustard seed, you can move mountains. <laughs> yeah, but you can't, right? So like, it's never gonna happen. You can't. You can't move a mustard seed, let alone a mountain. So there's this intrinsic catch 22 way to defeat people. Like if you don't, if you can't move a mountain, then it's because you don't have enough faith, right? So it's like, it's the way to char people with this brush from the beginning of Christianity as well. Well, yeah, like, I mean, obviously she just didn't have enough faith to move a mountain. So obviously she's not a real Christian. Yes. Or I feel like it's always your fault. It's either because you don't have enough faith and or yeah. it's because there's a sin in your life that you might not even be conscious of that's preventing God from moving through you and speaking to you. And I definitely wrestled deeply with those my entire childhood of like, what is my hidden sin that's preventing God from speaking to me directly or giving me visions and allowing me to pray in tongues? Like what's, do I not have enough faith? And I would test my faith as a kid. I I write about how I tried to walk on water and didn't, well, didn't work guys. Spoiler alert. I know. So spoiler. (laughs) It's very difficult unless you're one of those basilisk Jesus lizards and Central America or wherever they live. Okay, so uh, we have we have one more question, um, and and this is I, I, I mean it, I'm going to ask it. I don't want to tr- trigger anybody. Watch. I mean I have talked to a lot of former 
believers, now atheists, who I've talked to atheists, this actually is a common thing that comes up at our FFRF conventions, um, who have been atheists for 30, 40, 50 years even, and they still often wake up in the middle of the night scared of hell, having nightmares or something like that. And somebody's asked whether or not you um, still have kind of those issues. Do you still have religious trauma that that lingers, I guess, might be a, a nicer way to ask mm-hmm. that or an easier way to ask that. Sure. Um, I definitely, like I like I said, when I was playing D&D, um, I definitely am aware of some triggers that every now and then will flare up. But uh, I, I don't have the misfortune of waking up with nightmares anymore. I know a lot of people go, go through that. Um, I've been out of it for about 13 years now, um, 13 years that I've been an atheist and I guess 16 years since I was an evangelical. Um, mm. And I... I'm grateful that I'm no longer terrified of hell. I would say that that did take a while to leave my nervous system, though. I remember yeah. when I was still, um, to use the term like deconstructing, which is a term a lot of uh, former and doubting believers sure. use in the online space, um, I saw the movie Paranormal Activity that came out, and I didn't sleep for like three days because it, it <laughs> activated, even though I no longer believed anymore. Sure. I was quite... Yeah quite certain no there's no demons there's no hell that movie or another any horror movie really where it's like a demonic ghostly thing can still take me back to that place of terror um not doubt not not doubt anymore where i wonder like it used to put me in a place of doubt like what if that is real maybe i should hedge my bets and become a christian again and beg for forgiveness because wouldn't i rather err on the side of heaven than hell if just in case this is real um and i would comfort myself by telling me that if God is real. If he, she, they, them, it are the God, gods of love that I believed in, they would understand. And if they are loving, then there's definitely no hell. Or they're either they're either loving and not omnipotent or omnipotent and utterly sadistic. So that's mm-hmm. how I that's 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 what I told myself to um, assuage any fears that I had as they came up. But no, today, I haven't been scared of the demonic or or hell in a in a long time, and I'm grateful for that. I can watch horror movies now, and I'm totally entertained. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> never believed in hell. Um, I'm I'm glad I'm glad to hear that. I mean, I'll, I'll, it is a common thing that people who are even you know they're convinced atheists they they've then they've been that way for decades still sometimes wake up, and it's always something that really kind of breaks my heart doing this work. Um, but you know what? We are we're we're basically out of time. I mean, that's our show. That's Ask an Atheist for this week, Alice. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for sharing your story with us. It is a fascinating story. I really hope everybody goes and picks up a copy. The book is Wayward, a memoir of spiritual warfare and sexual purity. Go pick up a copy. Check out our other writings on Dare to Doubt and social media. And if you want more information, yeah, (laughs) well, (laughs) welcome. And if you want more information about the Freedom From Religion Foundation, check out our website at FFRF.org. And we will be back next Wednesday at noon central with another episode of FFRF's Ask an Atheist. 